congratulated Massachusetts that before uh, accepting Common Core, uh, you had the, uh, probably the best standards in the whole country. Uh, the state next to mine in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Minnesota, so proud of they are the Massachusetts math standard that they only took the Common Core English. They didn't take Common Core math. It, it, so uh, because they wanted to hang on to their Massachusetts standards. If it's good enough for Minnesota, people of Massachusetts, hang on to your standard, please. And a couple of things I'd like to say, I always say at, at my talks by way of introduction. Number one, I want it absolutely clear, please understand, that this talk, and uh, I've given 180 Common Core talks now in these 32 states. These talks are in no way, shape, or form meant to be anti-teacher, anti-principal, anti-school. I have a tremendous amount of respect and sympathy for the public schools. Uh, nobody in these states asked for this. This was handed to you. And you have got to make the best of it. And every state I've been in, it's been the same thing. Right? This comes very top down from the, from the government and then from the states. And so there's not much room for teachers to protest. And in 32 states, I've had thousands of teachers come up to me and tell me that they're against Common Core, but they can't say it in their schools. That they're against Common Core, but if their superintendent sees them at one of these meetings, they're going to be in trouble. So it's a big deal. And th I, I think the best thing we can do to support our teachers is to do everything we can to give them the power to teach our kids as they need them, not according to some overarching standards, not based on tests that they have very little input in writing, no ability whatsoever to grade, no ability whatsoever to change. That doesn't seem like a fair litmus test to our teachers. So I'd like to say that as well. Also, this is a hugely bipartisan problem. This is not a Democrat issue, it's not a Republican issue. In the state that I come from, Wisconsin, the biggest defenders of Common Core are Republicans. We have a Republican Senate, a Republican Assembly, and we've got Governor Scott Walker, right? And so the largest impediments to trying, the, the will of the people of Wisconsin is to get rid of these standards. We had four state hearings, and after those hearings, the, you had even Democrats in the legislature crafting legislation to impede or kill Common Core. And it was Republicans who held it up for a variety of reasons. In other states I've been to, uh, blue states, the onus falls more heavily on the Democrats who control things. So this is a hugely bipartisan problem. And the other thing I want to say, too, by, before I begin, um, I do not know what goes on in Shrewsbury schools. I have no idea. So inevitably, when I give talks like this in places that aren't my own, there will be people in the audience who might think that I'm, everything I'm telling you I'm implying goes on in your Shrewsbury schools. I have no idea about that. These may, this may be the best school district in the entire state. I have no idea. So uh, please, I'm going to give you a broad talk about Common Core, its origins and its dangers. I am not saying anything specific about, about your schools because I don't know. So uh, I, would, I would ask that nobody feel defensive about what goes on in your schools here about this. Here we are a couple years into Common Core. How many of you, as you sit here, would argue, with, by a show of hands please, that your knowledge of Common Core is vague and murky at the best? That what you know about, and would you please just look around? Do you understand what I'm telling you as we begin? 95% of every audience, and in these 180 talks, I think I've probably talked to about 70,000 people. If you add them all together. It's always the same. No one told you what this is. They're still not telling you what this is. This was put into your schools without you knowing it, and the people who support it have not done a very good job of explaining it to you. And that's just for starters. Right? Here you are, two years into this, to a year and a half, two years into this, and you come to these talks. I've been, we, we, every place we've gone on, why aren't the people who are for this doing this? With so much angst, so much consternation, so many problems with this, so much misinformation about Common Core, why are the people who support it so adamantly not doing these things? Those are questions we're going to have to answer as well, but I, that's a great visual to begin. So, with that in mind, let's begin with a brief overview of what Common Core is. Common Core. Common Core is an abbreviated term used to refer to the Common Core State Standards Initiative, a set of national standards for English and math with science guidelines forthcoming. Let's just stop before we even finish that sentence. They call them the Common Core State Standards. I have yet to figure out why. Because the states had no meaningful role in paying for them, in writing them, drafting them, in finalizing them, in verifying them, or in implementing them. 
It's true that people in most of the states got to see the standards, but not in a way that they could change them. I was in North Dakota a couple weeks ago, and we got into some radio back and forth. I do a radio show in, in North Dakota, and then the superintendent of North Dakota, North Dakota schools would get on the, would call in 10 minutes later and rebut what I said. So we never did get to meet face to face. But we did have one exchange when we were on the phone together. And she said, Dr. Pesta, that's just not right. 65 North Dakota teachers saw the standards. I said, well, what percentage of your, your teachers is 65? Less than 1%. All right. I said, how many 65 teachers saw the standards before you implemented them? Could your teachers make any changes to the standards? Well, no. Could they suggest changes? Well, no. So what was the function of the 60, a whole 65 teachers who saw the standards? What was their function? Well, there really wasn't any. And she answered all those questions I gave her credit. And when I asked her the other question, and would you share with us the criteria, how you picked those 65 teachers to look at the standards? That was when the interview ended. <laughs> and that's true of just about every state in the union. So they call it the state standards, I suppose, for the same reason they call uh, uh, Obamacare the Affordable Care Act. Because if you call something affordable and you oppose it, you can't be against affordability, can you? Right? And so these games that we play, and both parties do it, right? This is a bipartisan issue. It's a big problem. So they call it the Common Core State Standards Initiative. I'm not exactly sure why. That most of the states that took it, took it without even knowing what it was. So they call it the state standards. Set of national standards for English and math. And how about this little naming trick? Common, the words Common Core are branding so badly across the country right now that they've changed the name of the forthcoming standards. The forthcoming science standards are not called Common Core Science. They are called the Next Generation Science Standards. And as you will see, every subsequent, the other standards that are coming down the road, the, the history standards and some of the other ones, they're not called Common Core either. It seems to me, if what we're told about how overwhelmingly outstanding these standards are, why are we running away from the name? If you open the Next Generation Science Standards, you can see them online now. The words Common Core appear 40 different times in the first 20 pages. They just changed the name, right? So that's where we sit. Where'd they come from? Well, the, the Common Core standards in English and math were written by the NGA and the CCSSO. These are, for lack of a better word, two Washington lobbyist groups. When you hear the National Governors Association, it's very tempting to think, hey, that sounds like a good idea. 50 state governors get in a room and bang out education standards. I wish that would have happened, even though it would have been a disaster. Because what exactly qualifies your state governor, who's a Democrat, to write standards? What qualifies my governor, who's a conservative? What qualifies him to write education standards? What qualifies any governor in the country to write an education standard? You understand, right, that if you're gonna write a national standard in English and math, or science, or anything else for that matter, it requires a whole lot of things beyond the ability to teach high school math or middle school science. It's not something anybody can do. And so when you hear the NGA, you're tempted to think, OK, the National Governors Association. Well, what is the NGA? As one sitting governor described it, this is a lobbying group that allows politicians and their aides to meet with activists and constituents about how to shape policy. These are two Washington lobbyist groups. The people in these groups have not been elected to anything. They are utterly unaccountable to you and me, the taxpayers and the voters. How does this happen? What qualifies these two groups to do this? And why would the federal government allow it? Can you imagine any other lobbyist groups who just decided to go ahead and write out education standards? Do you think, when you think about our federal government, federal government over the last 20 years for that matter, the federal government is very, very jealous of its prerogatives, aren't they? That the, the government clearly defines what its role is, and it's very jealous of people who try to take over from it. In fact, our government is continually trying to expand its reach of influence, for better or for worse. How in the world did this happen? Well, let's stop, step back for a second. Who paid these two organizations? Where'd the money come from? Well, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, back in 2008-2009, ponied up $150 million originally for the activists in these two groups to write the standards. I see a lot of you taking, taking notes. I think that's wonderful. I'll make every single slide I show you today available to you free of charge. When we're done, I'll put up a website. And you can go to that website, and you can get every one of these slides for free. Because you don't know me. 
You don't know me from Adam. I urge you to take the slides and verify every single one of them. If, if you do, and you find out that I'm not lying to you, because in 32 states and 180 talk, 80 talks, no one has come to me and said, hey, you are telling the truth. If you're the first, you come and let me know. And if you find out that I am telling you the truth, and don't believe me, believe your own eyes, 95% of what you're going to hear today isn't even from me. It's all documented where it comes from. Go look yourself. And if you find out that I am telling you the truth, then I have one sincere request for you. Hold the people who tell you it's wonderful to exactly the same standard. Require them to show you how they, under, how they know what they say is true. That's how you get to the bottom of this, okay? So who paid for this? The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And let's stop there. As we sit here today, Bill and Melinda Gates have spent $2.5 billion with a B on Common Core. 90% of that money has gone to advertise for it, to give grants to educational organizations to support it. Do you know that the National PTA, the National Parent Teachers Association, received two $1 million grants before the standards were even written to begin the process of advocating for them across the state? You can go online. If you type in uh, Bill Gates Common Core, you can find a spreadsheet of every place that $2.5 billion was spent. It will blow you away. Why did 176 Roman Catholic diocese schools adopt Common Core the very first year it came out? Why did they do that? Given that their standards were already significantly higher than public school standards, why did they do that? Well, the NCEA, the largest Catholic teachers watchdog group in the country, the National Catholic Education Association, has taken hundreds of thousands of dollars from the Gates Foundation. The Fordham Institute, the only think tank pro-Common Core people ever cite, the Fordham Institute. And why do the pro-Common Core people cite it? Because it's a conservative think tank. The Fordham Institute is 100% committed to Common Core. Oh, and when you look at Bill Gates' list, $6 million of Bill Gates' money to the Fordham Institute over the last two years. Follow the money. It always works. And so let me ask you a question. What qualifies Bill Gates to participate in the writing of educational standards? Isn't this the guy who dropped out of college to go work in his garage? And good for him for doing it. God bless him. I hope he makes another billion dollars. But what exactly are his qualifications to oversee this enterprise? And if you're taking notes, which is good, another thing I would ask you to look up is Joy Pullman, P-U-L-L-M-A-N. Joy works with the Heartland Institute out of Chicago. And the Hartman Institute, she, Joy has written the definitive article on the origins of Common Core. It's been picked up by the New York Times. It's been picked up by the papers in London. And Joy traces Common Core to five activists in these two lobbyist groups. Chief among them is David Coleman. That's a name you must look up. David Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N. This man has an unbelievable past. And not much of it is devoted, not much of it qualifies him to write education standards. David Coleman, deep ties to the federal government. He was a school schoolmate of Arne Duncan, who was our Secretary of Education, right? And beyond that, no sooner did David Coleman oversee the writing, he was the architect. No sooner did David Coleman oversee the writing of these standards than he immediately left Common Core and became the CEO of the college boards where he is right now transforming the SAT to be Common Core compliant. That's what you call incestuous. He's, this guy's been elected to nothing. Bill Gates paid all this money for David Coleman to write the standards. And then no sooner did he write them than he dismissed himself from Common Core and was miraculously promoted to the CEO of the college boards, where the SATs and the AT ACTs will shortly follow. So think about that for a second. Before you've had even two full years to digest Common Core in your schools to determine whether or not it works for your teachers and your kids, the exams that are going to be used to get your kids into college are going to be Common Core compliant. How does that happen? And do you honestly think that any of this stuff happens without the federal government? Do you honestly think a federal government, and especially this federal government, would allow these people to do this? So it gets even better than this. How do they get into your schools? I don't care how much money Bill Gates has, he cannot buy his way into the federal schools if the Department of Education doesn't want him to. 
if the federal government, President Obama doesn't want him to. How do they get into your schools? How many of you have heard of Race to the Top? Well, all right, that's good. See, 95% of you are fuzzy on Common Core, but you've all heard of Race to the Top. What was Race to the Top? It was a federal program. It was Barack Obama's program. Back in 2008 and 2009, when the president was stimulating things like banks and car companies, uh, he decided he wanted to stimulate education too. So what he did is he took $5.1 billion of taxpayer money initially, met much more has been paid since then, $5.1 billion and set it aside, and allowed states in various levels to begin to apply for that money. I'll give you an example, New York State. New York State took $700 million from the federal government in 2009 through Race to the Top. And that money was allowed to go right into New York's education budget. They could spend it on tetherballs or computers or teachers, whatever they wanted. And the only string to accepting that money was if you took Race to the Top money, you had to adopt the Common Core state standards when they were finally written. That's how the vast, well over 40 states got Common Core, simply by taking Race to the Top money. Sight unseen. Over 40 states, 40 states took Common Core simply by applying for federal Race to the Top money. Now, you see what I'm telling you? Common Core had no ability to put itself in your schools. Bill Gates had no ability to put it in your schools. The federal government did through Race to the Top. Now let me ask you another question. I got a lot of them to ask you. They're all rhetorical. <laughs> I believe with all my being that if the standards were absolutely identical to what they are now, and let's say instead of Bill and Melinda Gates, it was the Koch brothers who put up $2.5 billion. And instead of two left-leaning lobbyist groups, you had two right-leaning lobbyist groups. And instead of a very liberal president, you had a very conservative one who basically took pack taxpayer money and bribed 46 states to take a set of curriculum standards that they hadn't really seen and that they had no ability to change. Do you, do you think most of the people who support the standards now would still support them? No. The Koch brothers. It, it, it almost might be worth it to watch Harry Reid's head explode all, all over the Senate. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But I tell you, I, I would be just as bothered by it if it happened that way. And you know, whenever you talk to the, the, support, the supporters of the Common Core, they never want to talk about this. They, they're just standards. Can we just focus on the standards? No, we can't. We're going to get to the standards. You need to know where they came from. This is banana republic stuff. And why do you think the federal government did it this way? Why didn't they just, like national health care, why didn't they just force it through? Well, because of a 1965 federal statute that prohibits the federal government from creating either national curriculum or national standards. That's why. They are legally prohibited from doing so. They can't do it. So they did the next best thing. Each of the five members of this small cabal who wrote the standards, and I'll give you some of the other names moving forward, but if you look at Joy's article, you'll get all the information. David Coleman's the one you need to know. But each of these five individuals who wrote the standards have deep and profound ties, both to the Department of Education and to President Barack Obama. David Coleman is a huge money fundraiser for uh, Barack Obama's two election campaigns. Here is the first shocking thing I'm going to show you. This is the actual copyright for Common Core. The NGA Center and the CCSSO shall be acknowledged as the sole owners and developers of the Common Core state standards, and no claims to the contrary shall be made. So the people who own the curriculum that is in the process, the standards, that are in the process of transforming America's schools public and private, are unaccountable to the Department of Education, to the Senate and the Congress of the United States, to the governors, to the states, to the teachers' unions, to the teachers, the principals, the superintendents, and the moms and dads. That's what I call banana republic. What enables these people to do this? Even if you think you like the standards, how can you, be, how can you accept how this is done? And if you don't like them, what mechanism do you now have to remove them? Who do you elect out of office? You can't go after David Coleman. He's busy making $100,000 a year to transform the ACTs and the SATs. Who are you going to go after here for this? 
And this is, this is the kabuki dance we do about Common Core. When you say it's a federal, and I'm telling you this is federal, because the race to the top program, a federal program, is what got it in your schools. And when you say that to some of your administrators or principals who defend this, they're going to say, oh, no. Now here's the copyright. It's not federal. This is the game that we play. Right? You look this up for yourself, because this is exactly how it happened. By way of comparison, who can tell me what the last big state federal standard education program was that Common Core replaces? No Child Left Behind. And in the interest of absolute bipartisanship, who gave us No Child Left Behind? President, President Bush. Bush. Now, interestingly, you maybe you'll be you'll surprise me. Every talk I've given in New England so far, nobody's been able to answer this question. George Bush didn't write No Child Left Behind. Who did he turn it over to? Ted Kennedy, Massachusetts, right? Teddy Kennedy wrote No Child Left Behind. And it was an absolute disaster. I have never yet, and I'm still waiting for the first one, maybe he or she is here tonight, I'm still waiting for the first teacher, principal, superintendent, somebody to tell me that they have anything but contempt for No Child Left Behind. It's a disaster. Every teacher I've ever talked to, every principal, they hate it. Why do they hate it? For three reasons. It's outcome-based education. You're focusing not on the kids that you get in your classroom and where they are when you get them, but the idea is you have to get them to this arbitrary standard that you set. Oh, sure, the standard may be higher than what you've had, or in the case of Massachusetts, the standards may be lower than what you have. But think about that. How many of you have kids or grandkids? Okay, all of you. Can you get your kids, your three daughters and your son, your three grandkids, your three granddaughters and your four grandsons, can you get them to perform at even relatively the same level in all the different subject areas? Of course you can't. And if you can't do it with your kids, how do you expect your teachers to do it with 60 million American school kids? It's not possible. Do you know also, there is not a shred of scientific evidence, zero, that simply having state standards or national standards, even high national standards, there's not the slightest shred of evidence that simply having standards has one little percent's worth of impact on how your kids perform in the classroom, zero. There have been 40 studies done in the last 50 years Simply having or professing or declaring or tattooing standards on your foreheads, it does not have any impact at all on how your kids perform. And if you'd like to see the most recent standard set of uh, data on this, just last year, the Brookings Institute, left-leaning Brookings Institute, published the most comprehensive study of its kind that finds absolutely no correlation between standards and performance in the class. And let me try to dispel, can we put one other red hair in the bed? This weird idea here, that if you don't support Common Core, you just don't support standards. Can we just put that to bed? Because education by definition is standards. If you're doing grades and giving quizzes and assigning letter grades, if you're doing all that stuff, you are assessed, you have a standard. Sometimes, as I said, the standards are better and sometimes they're worse. Education by definition is standards. So this outcome-based education, what do we do? We set up an arbitrary standard, and the job of the teachers, well, how, if, you, if you're going to do a national standard in education, every kid in every classroom across the country is going to get to the same place. What's the only mechanism you have to measure that standard? Tests. Tests, right? And they call it high-stakes testing, don't they? And who's it really high stakes for? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the kids are getting left behind. They, no child left behind left a lot of them behind. But it's really high stakes for the teachers, right? Because if you're a teacher who can't get your kids to the standards, conceivably you might not get tenure, you might not get reappointed. If you're a principal who runs a school that routinely falls below the standard, well, you might be reassigned or lose your job. Right, that's the high stakes. And how many of you remember under No Child Left Behind what happened in 2006 and seven and eight, places like Atlanta, Georgia, New York City, North Carolina, where you had teachers, principals, and even two superintendents of schools who were taking the kids' standardized tests and throwing them in the trash and forging new ones. You know why? Because you can't get 60 million kids to one arbitrary standard. And why would you want to? Donna mentioned at the beginning here, all kids are different. The world needs more than CPAs. No offense to CPAs. Right? The world needs more than that. So what if a kid like me was really good in English and really, really bad in math? 
When I was in third grade, I had, for some weird reason, I did nothing to deserve it, but I had almost a college-level reading ability. So I read, they let me read college-level books. That's probably why I entered the high finance world of an English professor. <laughs> <laughs> but in third grade, my math grades and my math skills were decidedly second grade, and they still are. I can balance a checkbook. I can, more often than not, figure out how to leave a tip. And that's it. So what? So what? According to the new standards-based systems, we have to write that injustice. In the first place, it's unfair that I could read that well. And so consequently, we would have to find a way to level that up. And my math skills, which were just a little subpar, in the interest of fairness, we had to, we had to sacrifice a whole lot to get me to come up just a little bit. Right? Standards-based education. That's why they're doing, they have to do all this cheating with these tests. And it's also, if I may say so, one-size-fits-all education, isn't it? All right? It's cookie-cutter education. All kids aren't alike. All kids will never be alike. This endless procession of pedagogical whimsy designed to make our kids all the same, it's borderline Orwellian. And can I say this too? If at this point you want to tune out, maybe you've been giving me a fair shake till now, but you're looking for a reason to tune out and not pay attention to me, let me give you one. All right? Please explain to me why outcome-based education isn't a lot like Socialism. Sorry. <laughs> Please explain to me why it's not. Rather than accounting for the fact that your kids may or may not be particularly good in a certain subject, they may not try as hard, they may have difficult family situations, a whole host of reasons why kids, when you get them in the classroom, might or might not be able to do well at certain things. But the premise of outcome-based education is, is it doesn't matter whether your kid's smart or not in a certain subject. It doesn't matter whether his attitude is good or bad. It doesn't matter if she tries or doesn't try. All that matters is when you're done, everybody's in the same place. Isn't that socialist? Yeah. Yeah. Seems to me. And you know the irony is we've been doing outcome-based education for about 50 years. And it's never worked. But name me the last time the federal government decided, okay, our big totalizing scheme isn't working, let's break it up. Has that ever happened? Never. No. And so here's what I'm telling you Common Core is. Common Core is just no child left behind on steroids. Wow. All the worst aspects of no child left behind are Common Core. It's the endless high stakes testing. It is the ridiculous, the standard is even more arbitrary and broad. It's the one size fits all ratcheted up to dramatic levels. So what's the big difference? There's a couple of them, here's one of them. What was it that killed no child left behind? It wasn't the federal government repenting of their folly. It was the fact that Teddy Kennedy's program left enough state and local control so that working teachers in working classrooms and moms and dads realized it wasn't working. Common Core, No Child Left Behind was killed from the ground up. There was enough dissent, there was enough freedom in No Child Left Behind for teachers to do things that weren't No Child Left Behind if they were working. The tests weren't nearly as comprehensive and rigorous. One, they fixed that design flaw in Common Core. Arguably, the biggest difference between Common Core and No Child Left Behind is if this gets fully implemented, you will not be able to kill it from the ground up. Look where we sit here today. The moms and dads argue, and I've never yet met, and the teachers are right. You want to blame the teachers for your struggling, your struggling kids? I don't think that's completely fair. Our kids are struggling first and foremost because there's a, a, a terrific lack of parental involvement. Teachers will tell you that, right? The single biggest impact on how your kids per perform is you, moms and dads. Then the teachers, and then the, and it goes up the ladder that way. Think about this for a second with regards to your teachers. This notion about this, the, the no child left behind. Working teachers were able to see it wasn't working with moms and dads. Look at you where we began this lecture today. You're the, the key piece of this puzzle, moms and dads, and you are the ones who know absolutely the least about it. I've talked to thousands and thousands of teachers of Common Core, and they still can't tell me what it is, or why they're doing it, or ultimately what the purpose is. So you don't know. And the teachers don't really quite know what to make of it. And I've talked to already about six of you before the meeting who told me you've been to try to talk to your principals, your superintendents, your school board mem mem members, and they can't tell you what it is. Not in a meaningful way. You see the difference between this and No Child Left Behind? It is a totally top-down paradigm. You're not going to get out of this from the ground up. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And you're not going to be able to fix it. Right now in your schools, in No Child Left Behind schools, 
If you have a problem with a book that's being read or a, a sexuality issue or a movie that's being shown, you can go up to your teacher and you can opt your kid out. 99 times out of 100, easy peasy, that's the end of it. But ask yourself this question. If every subject now has to conform to a national standard, they're even making common core standards for gym class, art, and music. And it's going to have to conform and they're going to have to be tested. Everything. The minute they get this all fully implemented, if they ever do, do you think you're going to be able to opt your kids out of something that is going to have to be tested national? You know what's going to happen? Your teacher's going to tell you, I can't do it. Send you to the principal, going to send you to the superintendent. Somewhere along the line, someone's going to hand you the number for 1-800-Department of Education. How, long, how much Muzak do you think you're going to have to listen to before Arnie Duncan picks up the phone? It's a serious question. Because you haven't had your first test yet, not your first national ones. Do you know there are three states that did? There are three states in the union that have had Common Core two and three years longer than you. Those states are Florida, New York, and Kentucky. One red state, Kentucky, one blue state, New York, and one oddly squishy purple state, Florida. <laughs> all three of them, after two years of localized Common Core testing, all three states want out now. All of them. They're desperate to get out. Governor Scott of Florida just pro passed a law precluding Florida kids from ever taking a single national test on Common Core. Don't you see by doing that, that makes it not federal anymore? That's a good start. And if you're dealing with the question of park or no park, no park, let me tell you why. Because if this is such a wonderful thing, Common Core, it will be wonderful two years from now and three years from now and five years from now. And if it is so wonderful, like they all tell you it will be, then get on them. But you jump into park now, you aren't getting out again anytime soon. Why not stick with me if it's just exactly right? Even if you think Common Core is wonderful, it will be wonderful in three years. What is lost to Massachusetts? You have a much better infrastructure than most states. Even if you teach Common Core, which I don't advise, but even if you keep it and keep your eye on it, but get out of the park testing, then if it's wonderful and I'm just an idiot, go ahead and jump into it in three years. But if it's not and you get into park right away, then you're on the hook for a whole bunch of stuff. You see what you've done on the federal level? Why? And whenever you throw this out there to the people who support it, they get really cranky, but they don't have an answer. Because there is no answer. There's no reason on earth your kids need to jump into this right now. As a matter of fact, couldn't you make an argument that if you think Common Core is wonderful, if you give, us, you give the Massachusetts teachers three years to, to wallow in this wonderful set of standards, that they're going to be really be much better at it when you go to test them? That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? But the people who support Common Core will not postpone the test. You have a real opportunity now to send a message. Get out of park. You can always come back to it later. And then watch how all the other states in the unions are running away from it. You do know, right? Four states didn't take it to begin with. Now you've got Indiana, Oklahoma, and South Carolina in the last two weeks have all gotten out of it. Missouri is next, and there's others coming. So you're rushing to get into something that right now, 28 of the 46 states that took Common Core are desperately trying to get out of it. There are over 300 pieces of legislation crafted in 40 different states to remove Common Core completely or mostly from those school states. Why are you getting into it now, right? This is a big question for us. It gets even better. Because back in 2008 and 2009, the two chief lawyers at the Department of Education, the two chief lawyers, they both quit over this and called it a federal takeover of education. In, in, oh, and by the way, these two guys, they have since written a book together that they just published two weeks ago. I haven't read it yet. It's called The Coming Federal Takeover of Education. Here's what they said. In imposing the Common Core Standards and the aligned assessments on the states, do you see the two main reasons this is federal? The feds put it in, and the feds do the testing ultimately. Do you understand that makes it federal? In imposing the Common Core standards and the aligned assessments on the states, the federal government is violating three statutes and has put America on the road to a national curriculum. With respect to the race to the top Common Core scheme, because you can't separate them. There is no Common Core without race to the top. Robert S. Eitel and Kent D. Talbert, 
former deputy general counsel and general counsel respectively of the U.S. Department of Education concluded that, quote, these standards and the tests will ultimately direct the course of elementary and secondary study in most states across the nation, running the risk that states become little more than administrative agents for a nationalized K-12 program and raising a fundamental question about whether the department is exceeding its statutory boundaries. We've heard that phrase before, administrative agents. I've heard it in Massachusetts, just like I've heard it in New Jersey and Wisconsin. This idea that it comes from your schools. <laughs> this is Massachusetts. We've got good schools. We'll be able to control this. We'll be able to we'll take the standards and use them as a baseline. Think about what he's telling you. We have a parallel for this. It's called the Affordable Care Act. You know how all the states that are in Obamacare now, they have to go ahead and do these state agencies? And what does the state agency do? Can the state agency give you a different health care plan than the federal one? No, what do the state agencies do? They become administrative agents for the federal program, right? In other words, the states become little more than secretaries, bookkeepers, and money collectors to enforce the federal health care law. How can it be any different with Common Core? How could it be any different? Where is your state autonomy going to come from? Oh, and by the way, if you're on a state school board, ask yourself this. What good is the state of Massachusetts school boards and even the local district ones? What are they going to do when all of this is controlled and run out of Washington, D.C.? What are they going to do? And you keep hearing about how this is totally voluntary, Common Core, despite how I showed you it got there. This is totally voluntary. We're not requiring anything from anybody. Well, what happened two weeks ago when Indiana pulled out? Indiana pulled out and the feds came, this voluntary program, feds came to Indiana and said, hey, you can pull out. But if you do so, we are withholding your entire $220 million federal education budget. And unless you prove to our satisfaction, the Fed said, that whatever you put in place of Common Core is as good as Common Core, we are going to take away your waiver from No Child Left Behind. Does that sound voluntary? No. Yeah. So they bribed states to take it. And now they are blackmailing states to try to get out of it. How do you equate that with transparency, open-mindedness? Oh, it, it really does seem, doesn't it, like the federal government has a whole lot of esteem for the local control of Indiana. Because now that they want out, we're not going to give you a penny of federal money, and we're going to punish you in other ways. You think that's not going to happen in Massachusetts? It already is. It already is. They go on further here. Oh, and that's the other little trick I should